All right, we'll call to order the six o'clock legislative session for the Spokane City Council for Monday, August 24th. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please uh, call the roll? Council President Beggs? Here. Council Member Burke? Here. Council Member Cathcart? <clears throat> Council Member Kinnear? Present. Council Member Mum? Here. Council Member Stratton? Here. Council Member Wilkerson? Here. Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right, and uh, this evening we have a special guest with us, uh, Peter King from the Association of Washington Cities. And Peter, welcome to our meeting, and maybe you could introduce yourself and tell us why you're here. Uh, let's see, is he muted? Just a second, Peter, we'll get you. All right, try again. How's that? Perfect. Good, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Council President, members of the Council, I appreciate you taking a few minutes from your meeting tonight. Uh, I know you've got a busy meeting. I know that I wish I were in Spokane. You probably all wish you were together in uh, City Hall. But I'm here to present an advanced certificate of municipal leadership to Council Member Mom. Some of you may also know that she was recently elected as the secretary of the AWC Board of Directors by the members of the Board of Directors. So she also now sits on our executive committee. So congratulations uh, as well. A little bit of background on the Certificate of Municipal Leadership Program. It does offer all mayors and council members from our 281 cities and towns essential knowledge skills to effectively operate within the law, plan for the future, secure and manage funds, foster community and staff relationships. It was created back in 1997, so it's been around for about 23 years. And the basic certificate program requires mayors and council members to complete 30 uh, credits. The advanced certificate, what we're talking about this evening, it was added later, and it requires an additional 30 credits to be met by attending or participating in online seminars of AWC or non-AWC courses, plus a community service component. And that can include service on boards. I know you all serve on many other boards within the community state boards and commissions or other committees. So over 1,100 elected officials over the years have achieved the basic certificate and nearly 350 have completed the advanced certificate. So all of the elected officials in the state are automatically enrolled. Once you participate in an AWC meeting or event and register, you're in there. You can go on any uh, online anytime and take a look at your progress on meeting the uh, core, certificate, core areas. And there are four, <coughs> roles, responsibilities, and legal requirements, public sector resource management, community planning and development, and effective loader, local leadership. So we've expanded our online content uh, to accommodate your busy schedules and certainly restrictions on travel now. Uh, COVID, uh, you know, just accelerated us putting so much more content online. So this year, as an example, our, our entire AWC conference in June was virtual. Uh, by going in, any elected official can go in and register for, for that between now and the end of the year. The content is available, and you can get 10 uh, credits toward the CML by doing that. Uh, next year, COVID Hopefully, COVID will be uh, in our rearview mirror, and we will be in Spokane. Our annual conference is scheduled for Spokane in the third week of June, so I hope to see all of you face-to-face. Uh, -face. Also, workshops and different events we have, they're recorded. Last week, in fact, we did our very popular budgeting workshop. Uh, that typically is held in Leavenworth uh, each year, but that was done virtually. That's available uh, via recording. We also had a two-hour training on uh, race equity and leadership a workshop. That is also online. So literally, much of our content is online, and many city officials now find that they can complete those 30 credits or, in fact, 60 credits by doing everything online. So take a look at our website. Uh, and with that, I will want to acknowledge uh, Candace 
Canada's continued commitment to education and community service through all of the additional trainings and leadership roles. So congratulations for your achievement on the advanced CML. And on behalf of AWC President Sue Wing Moody, Mayor of TWISP, and the entire AWC Board of Directors, I extend my sincere congratulations to Council Member Candace Mum for your achievement and dedication to continued education on behalf of the Spokane community. Congratulations. Thank you. You guys sneaked this up on me. This is a surprise. <laughs> what are they doing here? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I have thrown the gauntlet down and challenged the mayor and the rest of the council. Uh, as you know, I'm challenging um, the rest of the executive board to see who can get their whole council and maybe even the mayor to finish their basic uh, CML. And I've got to say, I went in and looked today, and Councilmember Wilkerson, you got some extra credits. You've been starting on it again. I saw that. Okay. And so, she, and, and Councilmember Burke's really close. So it's going to be a, a, a good race. Um, and I even heard from the mayor. So I think we've got the challenge going, mm -hmm. and it's pretty easy to sign in there. And i got to tell you, the time I invested in learning all of those things sure saves me time on the back end. So the, the hour or two you spend training, all of a sudden everything else you're doing just goes so much faster. So it's really worth the invested time. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for taking that time out to do this for us tonight. Thank you. Congratulations, Candace. And um, thank you, Peter, for um, taking some time out to uh, make the case and recognize Candace and all, for all the work that you do. And so and with thank that, you. Uh, with Candace, since you're already front and center, we're going to have you read a proclamation for us tonight. Thank you. Uh, this is the Biggest Spokane Proclamation uh, about voting. Uh, whereas in 1910, with every county in the state voting in favor, Washington was the fifth state in the union to enact women's suffrage, a women's voting rights, aiding in the inspiration of the national campaign that led to the creation of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And whereas August 26th of this year marks the 100th anniversary of the certification of the 19th Amendment into the Constitution of the United States of America, on November 2nd, 1920, for the first time in history, over 8 million women across the U.S. voted in elections. And whereas the women's suffrage movement also aided in launching and supporting additional local and national campaigns to secure voting rights for all citizens, including Native Americans, African Americans, and non-English speaking citizens through the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And whereas in recognition of the progression of our shared history, the city of Spokane strongly supports civic pride and encourages all citizens to be active and involved by voting. Now therefore, Nadine Woodward, mayor of the city of Spokane on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, does hereby proclaim August 26th 2020 as Women's Suffrage Centennial Celebration Day. All right. And we have to also put a shout out to May Ockwright Hutton because she was a force that really worked for women's rights in Spokane. We've got an elementary school named after her, and those of us in Spokane always look to her as a leader in women's rights. All right. Thank you. And I was going to give a quick report on the Public Infrastructure, Environment, and Sustainability Committee from today's uh, committee meeting. Uh, we had a long discussion on fluoride in the water, and the Accor Foundation uh, was presenting on the millions of dollars they've raised to support that. Um, and we are having, again, just a reminder, an open public forum this Thursday night from 6 to 8. We're going to hear from the state water quality people. We're going to hear from uh, Safe Water Spokane, who are opposed to fluoride, and we're going to hear from Smile Spokane, who are pro-fluoride, and we'll have uh, at least an hour of public comment. You sign up ahead of time if you want to um, get more informed and also provide your opinions on that. We also had a, a robust discussion about Highway 195 corridor right now. Uh, some of that development uh, near Eagle Ridge is restricted because of traffic volumes and traffic safety, and we heard from the State Department of Transportation on what it's going to take to reverse those moratoriums um, and get things going. And mostly it sounds like they need to 
reduce volume uh, going on to the I-90 um, interchange and some ideas were some um, interior network streets and other things, but that was a good conversation. And then we also heard about an extension of our U-Help utility ordinance and a $660,000 grant we got from Department of Commerce to help pay rent for young adults in Spokane. And then my last bit, just a personal privilege, I just wanted to recognize that one of our members, Council Member Michael Cathcart, uh, married the love of his life, Vina, this weekend. So congratulations, Council Member, uh, and for making that happen. And Vina, we've appreciated seeing you around, and now you're officially part of the team. So thank you for that. Um, with that, we'll turn to uh, boards and commissions appointments. Reappointment of Travis Tramp to a three-year term on the Hotel Advisory Commission from June 9, 2020 to June 1, 2023. And reappointment of Lance Kistler to a second term on the Spokane Human Rights Commission from June 12, 2020 to December 31, 2023. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Abstentions? All right. Uh, congratulations, Travis and Lance. Thank you so much for your service. And anyone else who's interested in serving on one of our boards and commissions, please let the mayor's office know. They do the vetting and we do the confirming, but it only works with your participation. Thanks. And we've got no um, special budget ordinances or emergency ordinances. So. Resolutions? Yes, resolutions. Okay. Resolution 2020-60, recognizing the South University District sub-area plan. All right, we have uh, Cliff Winger is signed up to speak on that. And does he need to do... He needs to hit star three, Cliff, and then uh, Hannah Lee will make you go live. We s All right. Yeah, uh, Cliff, could you hit star three again if you're still there? All right, I'll see if there's any, is there any council Commentary on the South University District sub-area plan. President? Yes. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention, we had an email um, or some commentary that was sent in from a, uh, one of the businesses down there, and I, I asked Chris kind of what, what the issue or how it would impact them if they were going to be negatively impacted, and, and he basically thought that they're they're just outside of, of the boundary, but but if they were impacted, that they would be vested with what they're involved in right now. So, okay. no impacts to them, and I haven't seen any other real negative commentary about it. So, sounds like a good plan. Okay. Great. Any other commentary from council? Questions? Last chance for Cliff at star three. Um, I'll just say I took a tour of the Catalyst building and the hub building there and there's a lot of exciting plans for that area and updating the zoning there is really going to help take things take off. Uh, there still needs to be a lot of work on parking though and so um, we have to figure that out. Uh, used to be plenty of parking, no meters, people just park and it's fine but now there's going to be a lot of parking demand so I'm looking forward to city staff and the U District working together on that. Um, um, do we have a yep. Do we know if Cliff is signing the support or not support? It doesn't say that. Um, I am not sure. I know that usually when Cliff's talking, he's usually talking about lots of affordable housing. That's usually what he's in support of. But I don't. I know he commented on on this. I just don't remember his specifics. Um, 
Okay, with that, we'll go to a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President is an aye. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, and that passes seven to zero. Uh, next resolution. Resolution 2020-61, expressing the City Council's disapproval of the potential use of city funds or city personnel for so-called killology training. Do you want to discuss that, Councilmember Burke? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so we have uh, had this in committee and also Councilmember Kinnear helped me. So the last time my, my uh, volume wasn't working. Um, but this is just a resolution expressing that we uh, are not interested in killology, killology training coming to our area. Um, and it also supports um, and backs up our police chief who also signed on to a letter um, against this as well. So um, it was really driven by the community. So I just wanted to uh, thank the community members for bringing this to our attention um, and uh, let them know that we heard them and that we saw all the signatures um, that they were passing around and that it's a really serious issue for um for our city, but also our county, and what happens in the county does affect what happens in the city. So, thank you. All right, and we have uh, we have several people signed up, and uh, the first one's going to be David Gosnell, and you can go ahead and do star three, and just uh, so everyone knows, we've got three minutes. Uh, we don't have a visual uh, in real time, so I'm going to give you a Reminder very quietly at 30 seconds uh, that your time's almost up. And then when your time's up, I'll ask you to press star three again um, and let the next person speak. And after David is going to be Anwar Peace and Nicolette Oakletree, Emily Peters, then Natalia, then Jonathan Crowley, and then Alexis Galloway to Nascot. So, um, David Gosnell, if you would like to press star three and then introduce yourself and start. All right, I'm not seeing David Gosnell yet, but is Anwar Peace. You wanted to hit star three. Uh, Mr. Mr. Peace, go ahead and introduce yourself and I'll start your clock. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Anwar Peace and I'm a police accountability activist as well as one of Spokane's newest human rights commissioners. As a police accountability activist, I support the council in passing the resolution dealing with the training philosophy nicknamed Kellology. In my years of activism, I have deciphered and studied hundreds of officer-involved shooting cases, both locally and nationally. I've spent time watching body camera videos, as well as reading the police reports of these incidents. And I have been also on a officer-involved crime scene while a dead body is laid on the streets. I sadly have spent time with those family members who have been touched by police violence in their lives. I've talked with, their fa with the family members about their family member's death. I've cried with them. I've even shed blood with them. So what I'm about to say next comes from a place of experience and knowledge. Killology and the warrior mentality-based training for police as well as the 21 foot rule are the very reasons why the rash of police killings have been taking place in the first place. Now I cannot begin to understand why Sheriff Ozzie would want to bring this dangerous training into our town. Some say it's because of, the, because of his own political ambitions and or his lack of empathy towards the community. I'm not sure about that because I haven't met the man. So I honestly cannot say why he's doing this. But Sheriff Ozzie, if I might make a suggestion to you, instead of bringing this training into our town, which the community does not want, how about instead starting a pilot body camera program? Because that is something the community does want, as well as can get behind and support the sheriff's office in doing. So, Sheriff, the ball's in your court. 
You can be an agent of change by bringing the body camera system to your department, or you can t continue to do the same old status quo, which has led us to this exact moment in time with the community police relations in this town. The choice is yours, Sheriff Ozzy. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peace. And if you could hit star three, and then next up is Nicolette Oakletree and Emily Peters and then Natalia. And Nicolette, go ahead and hit star three when you get a chance. All right, Nicolette, welcome to City Council Virtual. Go ahead and introduce yourself and I'll start the clock when you start talking. Hi, I'm Nicolette Oakletree. Uh, thank you, City Council, for introducing this resolution denouncing killology training and formally expressing your disapproval of the potential future use of city funds and personnel for those training purposes. Police use of deadly force is on the minds of all Americans again today. After just last night, Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back by a Kenosha, Wisconsin police officer. Mr. Blake's three sons watched him from inside the car. Video footage of Blake being shot swiftly went viral, um, serving as a catalyst for protests and riots across the country, fueled with the residual rage that is living in the post-George Floyd world. What's happening isn't just a trend, it's an upheaval of an unjust system that has its roots so deeply embedded in the fabric of our country that it's woven itself into every institution from here to the White House. At the core of my personal beliefs about why I reject killology, is the unwavering value I place on human life and human rights. A death sentence is about one of the most serious things I can think of, and it ought not to be taken lightly. And our police officers are not meant to be judge, jury, and executioner. As a society, we have to get better at how we approach even the most dangerous situations and do so with a fundamental respect for human life and human rights. And I do not believe David Grossman's killology training shows a fundamental respect for human life and human rights. Instead, he focuses on a concept he's dubbed killology, or the study of killing, and he uses it to teach officers to kill with less hesitation. Agencies across the country have been turning away from the courses in recent years after it was discovered the Minnesota police officer who fatally shot Solando Castile had taken one of Grossman's courses, the same police department responsible for the murder of George Floyd. If you're prepared to kill, David Grossman says, it's just not that big of a deal. I do think it's a big deal. And in a deeply disturbing and gut-wrenching creepy comment, Grossman has also claimed that killing can lead to great sex. Glorifying and sexualizing the, kill the killing of civilians does not do justice to the duty we all have to one another to respect our fundamental right to life. And uh, I think that the fact that this is even being considered kind of blows my mind, but I really respect the fact that you guys have gone out of your way to formally denounce it because it means a lot to the community, and I hope that it causes uh, Ozzy Knezovich to think twice. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolette. And if you could uh, hit star three to let the next speaker come forward, and that would be Emily Peters. If you can hit star three, and then after Emily is Natalia, and then Jonathan Crowley. All right, Emily, go ahead and introduce yourself. You've got three minutes. Emily? Still there? We okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Yes, is this Emily? Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Sorry about that. That's all right. Go ahead, introduce yourself, and you've got three minutes. All right. Okay. Um, my name's Emily Peters. Um, I have been researching Kilology for a couple months now as I've been part of the organization for the protests that have been going on against it um, in Spokane. And having uh, watched endless interview hours of interviews and uh, training videos by Dave Grossman, who is the man who will be teaching this um, in Spokane, and having watched uh, hours-long clips of his 
Bulletproof Mind training seminar, which is the one that uh, Knezovich has planned with him, I have found no redeeming qualities about it. Um, all of these quotes that have been brought up, all of these quotes that I'm sure that everyone here has heard all over the place, um, they are not taken out of context. Quotes like, the truth is we exist by virtue of killing. We are predators. We didn't spend all those years working our way up the food chain to not kill. He's using military tactics and military experience to teach police officers how to theoretically keep the peace. And that's not going to teach anyone how to keep the peace. It's, he claims to be teaching um, them how to psychologically deal with killing, and he claims to be the expert on that, and he's never killed anyone. Um, he's really not the right person to train um, the sheriff's department or SPD, which I know uh, SPD is not hosting it, but they will be able to attend if he does come. And we already have the fifth deadliest police department in the country with SPD. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. And if you could hit star three. And then Natalia is next. If you can hit star three. After Natalia is Jonathan Crowley and then Alexis galloway Tanaskit. All right, Natalia, go ahead and introduce yourself and... I'll start your three minutes once I hear you talking. Uh, hello, my name is Natalia Weldenbach. Mark, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, I am a newer resident to Spokane. I moved here in October, so I have not been here for very long. But I have also done plenty of research on chirology, and I must say that chirology has a wealth of research against it. Um, there are multiple, multiple sources of people uh, essentially stating over and over again that chirology is not useful. It, it does nothing but reinforce a violent militaristic mindset. And um, Grossman himself has been subject to quite a bit of scrutiny. The chirology uh, theology, I suppose you could call it, draws from the philosophies of S.L.A. Marshall and uh, uh, William Lewinsky, both of whom have been highly questioned by other psychologists with their approach to killing and killing psychology. Um, additionally, Spokane already, as has been pointed out, has the fifth deadliest police force in the nation. Um, also, a disproportionate amount of police violence is used against indigenous and black residents of Spokane, despite the fact that Spokane is significantly whiter than it is black or indigenous. Um, and uh, chirology training has, in general, been pretty widely condemned by other members of the community. There are two petitions to ban chirology, which between them have about 7,000 signatures as well as a letter to Sheriff Ozzie, um, multiple emails that have been sent to him. Ozzie knows that the community does not want philology, does not want tax dollars to be put towards this pseudoscientific training that does nothing but militarize police's, police forces against the communities they are supposed to protect. Um, that does not make people feel safe. Uh, Grossman has said multiple things that are Pretty questionable, um, as has been pointed out by Emily Peters. Uh, he talks about righteous killing and uh, honorable killing as if, as if the taking of a life should ever be um, kind of cast in that light. That's sort of disturbing. Uh, the trainings are not victimless. Again, as has been pointed out, Philando Castile was shot and killed by an officer who attended the Bulletproof Warrior Seminar, the same seminar that would be taken to uh, our um, sheriff's office, the, the chirology training that was slated for a sheriff's office was the winning mind and the bulletproof mind. Um, again, quite a lot of controversy surrounding these survival mentality trainings and really not much research has to be done in order to, it's, it's, it's very obviously not something the community wants. So I'm going to read quickly off of what was written. This is the chirology kills black people, right. ban the training in Spokane seconds. County. This campaign was created in Spokane for black life, just to wrap it up. Um, if, if SPD wishes to play the good cop, they must hold their fellow law enforcement agencies accountable and insist the community in stopping the sheriff's department from pursuing theology training and ideologies. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, thank you, Natalia. If you could hit star three. And then, uh, Jonathan Crowley, you're next. If you can hit star three to raise your electronic hand. And after that, it's Alexis Galloway to ask it.
All right, we're not seeing Jonathan yet, but Alexis, if you're there, if you could hit star three. All right, Alexis, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, you've got three minutes. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis Galloway Naskit. I am a local citizen, and I am also a um, descendant of Chief Joseph. And first of all, I would like to acknowledge that Spokane is situated on tribal land. Um, Next, I'd like to talk about the dehumanization within the killology training. So dehumanization happens when we refer to other people as being less important and less uh, worthy of respect than ourselves. And I see that when in the killology training when they refer to people as animals. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, dehumanization leads to discrimination, and discrimination leads to disproportionate violence against the dehumanized people. In Spokane, Washington, um, indigenous people make up 43, make up um, just, sorry, excuse me. Indigenous people make up 2% of the population in Spokane and indigenous people make up 43% of the SPD um, victims of shootings that were carried out by SPD. And for the rest of my time, I would like to have a moment of silence for all of the people who have died to SPD violence and their families. Thank you. That's the end of um, Alexis's time. Thank you, Alexis, for sharing with us. And I'll another sh query out there, if either David Gosnell or Jonathan Crowley are still there, hit star three. Um, all right, so um, go ahead and introduce yourself and I'll start your three minutes once you start talking. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving me time to talk. Hello, my name is David Gosnell, and I live in, here in Spokane in District 1. I'm here to represent myself and anybody that may agree with my words to this council. Mindset Boot Camp is a training that should not be denied from our police. To say that we should not prepare the men and women that, we put, that put their lives in the line every day is beyond foolish. It is dangerous. To train an officer to be prepared for all that can happen in the line of duty is a must or their physical and mental health. The idea classes like this are to make officers un less empathetic, to hurt people, to kill with no remorse and no reason is an outright lie. To stop training, to take away any of the non-lethal weapons, to lowering the pay, to lowering the number of officers, to claiming that a weapon is a military weapon so it cannot be used for the safety of our community, or even unarming half of the beloved police department like Councilwoman Burke wants are all ways of defunding the police. Um, excuse me. 
The hypocrisy of this council hurts the safety of the community. This council claims it does not want to defund the police, yet time and time again it votes to do so. On behalf of our community, I ask that you stop voting against the police. We want all the latest training for our beloved police officers, for it will cause but one thing, a safer community. The idea we must take funds from our beloved police for the, to pay for the new social workers that you want to add is wrong. Uh, you want to add the social workers, that is fine, but to make our community less safe to add these social workers is wrong and not acceptable. We can allocate money for these, um, from other places for this. Uh, for example, we can reallocate money from the funds of the salary of this council and its president. A $168,000 a year salary for the mayor is more than a little excessive. And I'm sure there are many, many other places the excessive spending is happening. These are just a few ways that we could fund the social workers without lowering the safety level in our community. I look to this council to, I look to remind this council and its president that you were elected to office to represent us, the people, not to force your political views upon us. So I ask, and I beg this council and its president to please stop voting against our police. The police, they need your support. They have earned your support. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mr. Gosnell. If you can hit star three, and if Jonathan Crowley is still there, if you could hit star three. Okay, uh, Mr. Crowley, if you could uh, introduce yourself. I'll start your three minutes once you start speaking. Um, hello, my name is Jonathan Crowley. I'm a student at Lewis and Clark High School and I'm here in favor of the resolution to condemn killology. Um, I think, I think uh, it's important to talk about the specific mandates of killology because the, um, the wording of this resolution isn't to uh, completely remove all police training, but rather to kind of remove specific mandates that are represented within Grossman's philosophy. So Dr. Kelly Welch of Villanova University in, in Pennsylvania uh, kind of talks about this idea of the criminal predator. Um, anyone familiar with Dave Grossman's work uh, will know that he kind of separates society into three sections. There's the sheep, which is of course a dehumanizing way to talk about people, um, which uh, are incapable of helping themselves. There are wolves who are immutably evil, who, uh, whose only intention is to submit to their base nature and consume and destroy these sheep. And then he places the people listening to his seminars as sheepdogs, whose responsibility is to take down the wolves viciously in order to protect the sheep. This sort of, this sort of um, animalistic description of people as predators is really is really very tied to a history of racial prejudice in America. The way that sort of uh, describing any human being as a predator um, kind of evokes a very long history of um, kind of describing people as brutish. This does not mean that the police should not be taught to appropriately deal with situations in their community, but rather that the way that um, Grossman and other training like its philosophies kind of exemplify the world are very steeped in a problematic idea of our community. Because ultimately, police officers, like everybody in this city council meeting, are the same. We are citizens whose responsibility to each other is to uphold um, our civic duties. It is not necessarily true that getting rid of problematic ideas in police training necessarily means that you are anti-police. 30 seconds. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Jonathan, thanks so much for uh, testifying. And good luck with school coming up. That brings us to the end of the public testimony. Uh, any council commentary on this resolution? Council Member Stratton. I just had a quick question from Council Member Phillips. Um, 
doesn't does it keep my support this as well? So, uh, to my understanding, that Chief Milo uh, doesn't want this training to be here, but Council Member Kinnear might have, uh, or Council Member President Beggs has, might have some more info. Council Member Kinnear, do you want to respond to that? Oh, Council Member Kinnear, do you want to respond to that? Um, you go ahead. I, I'll, uh, I'll fill in if okay. I that we need more information. Go ahead, Council President. Sure. I, I know I've heard um, Chief Meidel say that this, uh, he doesn't want any of his officers going to this particular training. And one of the things I appreciated about this particular resolution was it really commended Chief Meidel for a courageous written statement he authored. He is now the uh, chair of the Washington Association of uh, police chiefs and sheriffs, and in late June, he authored a letter uh, committing law enforcement across the state to addressing uh, systemic racism and working on use of force and really um, community reconciliation and police reforms. And I thought the letter was courageous and very positive. And then today, um, somebody forwarded me the PowerPoint that went with it and what the state organization is, is pursuing. And I think there's a lot of common ground and I appreciate that uh, Council Member Burke incorporated uh, that into her resolution. If I could add Council President, that letter reflects the um, executive board of WASPIC, which is the Association of Police Chiefs and Sheriffs. So it wasn't just Chief Milo hanging out there on a limb, it was the letter <clears throat> supporting the views of that organization. Thank you, that's helpful. Oh, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. So uh, a few things just to comment. Um, so for, first and foremost, uh, one of the comments that uh, I think it was Anwar made about body cameras and that uh, you know, the sheriff should be looking into this. Couldn't agree more. A thousand percent agree. Body cameras should be required in every every police department across the across the nation, as far as I'm concerned. So I would really uh, agree with that statement. Um, I also agree with a lot of what Nicolette and Emily said. I mean, their sentiments, I think, are 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 um, very accurate uh, in a lot of ways. And and I didn't have much to disagree with with what they were saying. My my concern here is simply with this resolution is simply that. This isn't something that the city is pursuing. It's not something that's ever been scheduled. It's not planned to be scheduled. Um, it's not something I've looked into because it's not a city issue at all. Um, and so I have said for months, and I, I still continue to say that I'm withholding judgment on this until Sheriff Ozzy has his community conversation uh, with the author to address the questions and address the concerns that the community has. And then we can hear a balanced both sides, hear all the facts uh, before that training occurs. And, and at that point in time, I'd be more than happy to, to offer an opinion on this. But really, today, we've only heard one side. I haven't looked into his books or watched any videos, as, as some of the folks who've called in have. Um, and so until I have an opportunity to really understand this for myself, uh, I have a hard time condemning or banning or, or anything like that with, um, with something that I just don't have enough knowledge about. So at this point in time, I'm, I'm neutral, but neutral means I'm voting no. Um, and so uh, that's that's kind of where I'm at at this point. Any other council commentary? Council President Vick. Yes, Council Member Wilkerson. So I understand uh, Council Member Pat Hart that this is really out of our purview. Uh, it's not in our city, but policing does not stop at borders or street names. And so that whole mentality, but I support this because we are moving or headed toward a season of healing and just the name of Chillology does not lend itself to where our community is trying to go. We have adopted the guardianship model. I think it's a good model. And so with that, headed towards our future, Chillology is not the word that inspires us going forward as a community 
in a healing mode. Okay. Any other commentary from council members? Council President. Yes, Council Member Kinnear. Thanks. Uh, Council uh, Member Wilkerson took the words right out of my mouth. I want to commend the young man from Lewis and Clark because I think he really hit it on the head as well. He also said something uh, to, the, to the degree that this isn't saying that all training shouldn't take place. Of course, police should be trained that we should be using a guardian model. This does not emulate what we're trying to do moving forward with our police department. And if you read this resolution, it talks about not just now, but in the future, we want to make sure that this doesn't come back. The reason that our police are not enrolled in this is because we have allocated no funding for training right now. So, it's kind of a, it's moot for us, but going forward in the future, we want to make sure that we're pursuing a model that is a, a guardian mentality and not a warrior mentality. So uh, thank you, Council Member Burke, for bringing this to our attention and shining a light on it. Appreciate it. Council Member, or Council President, if Yes. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to thank Council Member Kinnear and Council, Council President Beggs for uh, sharing your input um, and I, uh, you know, everybody else who weighed in and, and asked questions. Um, I, I see, as an elected official, there are many roles we can take, and one is obviously writing legislation, but the other one is using our platform. Um, obviously, resolutions are non-binding, and I see this as a way to send a message across the nation that we are moving into a direction um, that we do want to listen to our community members who are in fear and that we do want to respond to what they're saying about what's happening. And um, this is a time for us to do that. Uh, resolution is non-binding, but it does send a message and it does state that we firmly really do believe in this. Um, we don't want a chirology training coming to our region and we know that it would have negative impacts on our community members. So. Um, Again, I just really wanted to thank the community members who really rallied to get around this and got signatures and are trying to draw the attention to our sheriff. Um, so maybe this is another way we can um, draw some more attention to our sheriff that um, even more people don't want it here. And, um, and so, yeah, thank you all for your input and for your work on this. And um, I'm hoping for a yes vote from you all. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just comment that I think uh, one of the challenges, because I've just been scratching my head, why would we have a seminar called Killology related to law enforcement? It just reinforces so many stereotypes and problems and opens wounds. And I think if I was going to hear from sher the sheriff, he would say, I'm, I'm trying to take care of my officers. I'm trying to help them deal with uh, when they go through post-traumatic stress events. And I think we need to figure out how to not dehumanize suspects and not dehumanize officers and call them out for the people that they are and the dignity and worth that they all have. And we need to figure out how to take care of our officers in all the stress that they go through. I don't think this seminar um, takes care of them or gives them better standing in the community, which they need. Uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't help their mental health as far as I can, I can tell. And I have read a lot of Mr. Grossman's materials and watched him um, on, on video uh, to try to educate myself about it. So I think we can figure out how to take care of all of humanity in our community, regardless of whether they're wearing a badge or not wearing a badge. Um, this isn't the way to do it, this type of curriculum with this kind of language. So I'm going to vote uh, for the resolution, and especially since it affirms uh, the law enforcement uh, professionals across the state that are trying to move beyond stereotypes and old ways of doing things and more into community reconciliation and community public safety. With that, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President is an aye. Council Member Burke. 
Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Okay, that passes six to one. And that brings us to our first ordinance. Ordinance C-35819 amended, vacating portions of Alameda Court in the plot of Crowder's addition and more particularly described in the amended ordinance as requested by Community Frameworks. And Eldon, I see you're on the call. If I don't know if you wanted to pull up that map again for the people watching. Well, I'll see if I can check. <laughs> All right, we can see that map. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, basically what's going on here is community frameworks is vacating that shaded portion of that alley, basically to build an affordable housing project. And there's a couple of issues we had to figure out. Well, there's a sewer that runs down the middle of Alameda Court, and so we had to make sure they maintained access to the very end of it down here where the hand is. We did reserve easements for basically all the utility purveyors, I think it was the Vista, City of Spokane, Central Link, and Comcast, and we are going to build a portion of the parking lot across that actual shaded area, but we just don't want any permanent structures over the top of that thing in case we got to repair the sewer. But uh, those are the primary issues we have with that vacation. Be happy to answer any questions. All right. Any questions for Eldon? I do have a question. Yes. Go ahead, Councilmember Burke. Um, Thank you. Is this um, going to be at charge, or is this going to be a free nonprofit? It was determined when we had the hearing back in October of last year. It was a no-cost vacation. Thank you for the reminder. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Any other questions? Oh. And we don't have any community testimony on it. Um, so we'll go ahead and... Have a roll call. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes seven to zero. I did get an email from the uh, developers of this low-income housing requesting that the mayor sign this as soon as possible so that the 30 days that they have to wait uh, will go faster. So I'm reminding Terry, and if the mayor or the mayor's staff is watching, uh, we'd love to get this signed right away. So thanks. All right, no first reading of ordinances. That brings us to hearings. Hearing item H1, final reading ordinance C35925, amending land use and zoning maps for a 73 acre area within the South University District sub area. All right, and that's essentially the companion to the resolution we passed earlier about rezoning uh, in that area. Um, is there any, uh, Chris, do you have any presentation on this for? Council and the great audience? I do, thank you. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, like the council president said, is a companion to um, the resolution that you voted on earlier this evening. Um, so contents, you see the survey plan, the um, resolution that adopts that survey plan as kind of the policy framework. Uh, the subject for this hearing, this ordinance, would change uh, the comprehensive plan land use map and then zoning and overlay map boundaries. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about the different elements of this fairly briefly. We've done uh, urban experience committee study session and some briefings on this. Um, for folks following along on Channel 5 or elsewhere, um, I've got the um, project website that will also come up if you Google South University District sub area planning, um, that'll be your first result. 
Um, so the study area is um, within the larger 770-acre university district. This is a smaller portion of it south of the BNSF tracks. Um, it is from division to the Hamilton ramps, and then I-90 is the south boundary. Uh, existing zoning in this district is primarily general commercial with a 150-foot height limit. Um, so the plan commission had a hearing in July. Um, that was the... Um, they had originally scheduled that for March, and um, after COVID, uh, regrouped in July and um, held a public hearing, um, voted nine to one to recommend um, the resolution that you voted on already, and then this ordinance. Uh, a few notes on that, the um, staff proposed boundary, the plan commission modified that recommendation a little bit to include um, what's called in the staff report optional extension one, so this is um, southward on Sherman Street to uh, I-90, uh, you received, uh, uh, we received a comment uh, earlier today um, about a property in this area from one of the stakeholders, so I'll talk about that a little bit in a few slides um, and what some of the options are. Um, and then there was a lot of discussion of parking, that was a big issue, um, as uh, was mentioned a little bit earlier. and. Uh, the recommendation from Planning Commission was uh, not to extend the no minimum parking overlay. So I'll talk about that a little bit um, when I pull up that map as well. So the land use and zone changes that will apply in this area um, based on this recommendation. So a uh, um, comprehensive land use map uh, change from general commercial to downtown. Uh, and then that would be accompanied by a zone change from that general commercial 150 for this um, 73 acre area that's kind of concentrated on the T, as it was called at some point in the process, where uh, Sherman and Spig, uh have their intersection near the um, south landing of the University District Gateway Bridge. Um, that would change the zoning in that area to DTU, which is Downtown University. Uh, so here's a map of a land use map change, and kind of showing what's in the surrounding area. I'm going to focus a little bit more because it's the same boundary on the uh, proposed zone change. Can I check? Uh, the Chris? Of that. Are, uh, you, yes. are you thinking that you're showing us documents because we're not, we're just seeing you? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the heads up. Uh, okay, let's see. Sorry about that. It's all right. All right, we can see it now. All right, I will skip through. You've seen these slides a few times. Um, this was kind of the one I wanted to, to show you here. So this is... Um, this is the boundary of the zone change, um, and then all of the other subsequent uh, changes to overlay districts and things like that would, would also meet this boundary. Uh, um, this was what Plain Commission recommended as the boundary. Um, so you see there'd be general commercial 150 zoning left um, in the southeast and southwest portions of the district. Um, so you had a um, comment letter that was sorted just this afternoon. So we, we heard from some property owners um, at uh, 3rd and Sherman um, concerned about the proposed um, change to their zoning um, that kind of outlined some of the business needs of a um, credit union branch, which is the business there, and um, kind of going into the future, um, some of their concerns with um, being in the downtown university district zoning and um, that project. Um, I wanted to highlight, so there was a few different options that were looked at um, by plan commission. So the area in dark purple here, uh, this is the staff recommended um, boundary initially. Um, there were a few, two optional additions um, to that and, and plan commission looked at um, both of these, and they um, they voted to uh, add the area that's highlighted in yellow there. So that's along Sherman Avenue, um, 
And so the downtown university zoning in this would um, continue past second all the way to I-90 along Sherman. Uh, that's where the that's where the property owner um, where their property is. Um, that sent sent the comment. Um, so they would be under the plan commission recommendation within that um, boundary. Um, this is uh, the staff recommended boundaries uh, um, potential alternative if there's a lot of uh, concern about what was in those comments. So um, there's a few different approaches that are um, possible there. Um, overlay zone, so these implement uh, a lot of these implements. Yes. Yes. Oh, go ahead. You, you had sent an email that they had filed for permits so that they'd be vested. Is that is that accurate? Um, they, my understanding is they're in the process of putting together an application. They, they had a pre-development conference, so they're, they're working with the current planning on that. Um, I don't know how you know, close they are um, to that, but in terms of that three-day effective period, it, there's a possibility that they would um, get an application in and then best under the um, general commercial zoning if they were able to do that. Um, so there's uh, several overlay zones that could apply in this uh, area with the T. Um, so I will go through each of the maps on these. Um, first, though, on the off street parking. So uh, this, again, was a pretty um, uh, pretty big issue in terms of the feedback we heard from stakeholders. Um, there's kind of a high, almost a high, medium, and low level of parking requirements represented here. The, General Commercial 150 um, zone requires uh, off-street parking for new developments there. Based on what the use is, so it really ranges, um, but it's it's typically less than the downtown university zone by default, which is a one space for 1,000 square feet. Um, and then the other areas that have a downtown zone, um, such as other areas that are already zoned DTU um, or the downtown core, um, those have an overlay where there's no minimum off-street parking required. Um, many developers still provide that for financial or other, other reasons uh, for financing or for just the appeal of the project. Um, but um, the recommendation from Planning Commission and, and uh, with the staff recommendation as well as to not apply that overlay in this um, 73 acre area um, at this point. Um, there's a lot of um, businesses in that area that are on pretty small lots in older buildings, and there just is not a good stock of um, off street parking in the buildings that are there already. And it's, it's uh, not a lot of places where it would be easy for individual properties to redevelop and uh, uh, create a new. Um, uh, parking area, um, so that would help um, to kind of reduce that requirement at the same time, um, not to put them under too much um, pressure if there's new developments coming in. Um, so the other uh, comment that you received recently, this is on, on Friday, uh, was related to the complete street submissions. Uh, so these are uh, implements uh, downtown zoned areas with certain um, street frontages along these streets have certain requirements based on what type of complete street that they're on. Uh, so this this shows where um, Planning Commission um, they um, recommended adoption this half recommendation through these different um, complete streets. So this doesn't really regulate what happens between the curbs on the roadway. It's it's focused on um, what types of uses buildings can have along these streets and um, design of their building frontage, things like that, how, many, how much percentage of windows, for instance. Um, so one thing that came up in the comment um, that, that uh, was submitted on Friday, the Sherman Plaza is kind of an interesting situation because it's not actually a street, it's a platted lot. Um, staff and then the plan commission, they recommended um, having this type one complete street designation. 
on the browser um, as a kind of a means to apply or sort of um, suggest similar requirements for buildings that are along the plaza to have uh, more of an activated storefront boundary on that plaza instead of like a blank wall, um, as if it were the side of a building against a lot. Uh, we did hear at the study session a lot of concern about um, that might imply also, you know, more vehicle traffic if it's a type one complete street. Um, the regulation doesn't really have that um, effect, but um, and it actually wouldn't wouldn't um, necessarily um, have the same impact it may on other streets in the short term. Um, but as was mentioned in the comment letter, there's opportunities to maybe look at de designation for plazas or um, things like that to really clarify in, in these types of situations um, how that street should be uh, handled, both in terms of the properties around it and the use of it. Uh, surface parking limited overlay, so this um, prohibits um, commercial surface parking lots, so essentially parking lots that are on police that allows parking in um, commercial parking in parking structures and then allows surface parking that is supporting a particular use or building um, in new development. So um, this would perhaps prevent um, a demolition of buildings in this area to serve, for instance, downtown where there's a lot of um, spillover from people, say, working uh, in, in uh, west of division or on the campuses. Let's closer look at it. Um, the design review threshold map, so there's design review um, potentially in each of these areas. All public buildings already are subject to design review. Um, private buildings above 50,000 square feet would be in this area. Um, there's a few um, thresholds that are a little bit um, uh, easier to trigger than that for smaller buildings. Um, this is more consistent with what's already on the other side of the, the NSF tracks uh, at the WSU campus, for instance, and other parts of downtown. Um, so again, the plan commission recommendation, it was a, I was a nine to one vote. You have the, um, with the plan commission findings, and then there was a dissenting decision in there. Um, and recommended approval of this ordinance. As I described, there's, um, there was a recommendation to extend that zoning southward, and there was a um, property owner that's concerned about that potentially if, um, as their, as their um, project is sort of a, uh, at the very beginning stages of the permitting process. Um, so I have, uh, I can take questions, and again, thank you very much for the heads up on my display and not being. Right. Sure. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, Kelsey Recapture here. Um, and, and just also to confirm, so the the parking overlay uh, would prohibit, the, the surface parking restrictions, I mean, would prohibit uh, uh, Use for business use, uh, surface business use parking, like on a temporary basis until a, a parking garage can get built, right? That's that's correct. Yeah. So if there's a, a specific building that needs surface parking, I mean, it could if they find enough land, it could be all surface parking. It could be a mixture. Um, it's just not a rental lot for the general public. Right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Chris? Yes. All right. Um, all right. There's no public comment set up. So if there's no further questions or, or any, I should say this, any other commentary on this, actually. Councilmember Stratton. I just wanted to say thank you, Chris. It's a lot of work, and it's been a great job, and uh, we appreciate your time and your effort. Thank you.
All right, anyone else? All right, with that, we'll have a formal roll call adopting this ordinance. Uh, Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Aye. Council Presidents and I. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. Um, that brings us to our last hearing of the night and our last matter for the night. H2, Emergency Ordinance C35928, amending the zoning map of the City of Spokane's comprehensive plan to extend the CC3 zoning overlay in the vicinity of the North Foothills area and declared an emergency. Again, this is the... Uh, Gonzaga Haven project that the city's been involved with because we provided some of the land um, over in the Nevada Hamilton corridor right by Gonzaga Prep. And we have Tyrrell here who's going to give a little presentation about what this means. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tyrrell Black uh, from City Planning and I've been working on this for the last few months. Uh, and this was briefed to you last Monday and also was at Plan Commission on the 12th of this month. So Plan Commission uh, on this item also sends you a uh, recommendation of approval uh, with a 9-0 to zero vote on this one. So um, as Council President mentioned, this is on the North Foothills uh, Street between generally um, Hamilton and Perry are the two signalized intersections, but I'm going to show you a map as well. So I will try to share my, my map uh, now so you can see that. Okay, it says I'm sharing. We can see so it. We I, can see it. Well, <laughs> I will check this time. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So Council uh, did direct staff uh, earlier this year, in May of this year, to go through this planning process. We use what we call a, a abbreviated planning process, uh, and this is uh, in an area that is already designated as a center on the city's land use plan map. This is a map showing the area. Um, on this map, the area that we're talking about is highlighted in kind of yellow. Um, you can see Ham this is where Hamilton becomes Nevada. People are familiar with this little jog and, and the street. Also, when you're on North, North Foothill, kind of turns here, too, as you go by the, the city's water department uh, and Gonzaga Prep. The uh, Gonzaga Haven is one project in this area, and there's another um, public project in this area, which is District 81, is also uh, looking in this general vicinity to site a middle school. Both of these um, projects uh, in their aggregation of parcels found that they were in a multiple zoning categories. So the request was to add this zoning overlay, which would allow them to opt in um, to the CC1 zoning. So I'll show you in a little bit here, uh, the centers and corridor zoning that is around the area. I did want to mention that although it shows the lower field of Gonzaga Prep, there, um, it just made sense to include that, but there's no proposal for, for that and also um, the city's uh, fire district or fire station two is here uh, and that also there is no proposed change of that use. Uh, the process um, that we used is kind of outlined here again pretty quick. Uh, in May of this year council directed us to go out and do the sub area planning. We uh, did agency notification. We also notified property owners in the vicinity so we did a mailing uh, within 400 feet um, and we also put signs on the property. As I mentioned, the Plan Commission heard this item earlier this month, and they also, at the end of July, had a workshop to kind of talk through it. We also, um, I should add, and I have this a little bit later, but we did a, a virtual open house also, so the people who received mail notice also received notice of that. So I, I did have one opportunity to um, speak with some people in the area. The CC3 overlay uh, is outlined in code. Uh, what this does, um, Chris talked a lot about overlays, so a, a familiar concept this evening. Um, this overlay adds something instead of sort of taking away. It adds the option of using the CC1, which stands for Centers and Corridors Type 1, or the CC2 zoning. 
This allows um, the property to still retain the light industrial zoning, uh, but light industrial does not allow for residential uses, and especially Gonzaga Haven found that they could do a much better site design if they could put some of the residential uses on the area that has the base zoning of light industrial, so this uh, will allow that. This is the zoning map, so this shows a little more clearly. Um, in this, it's uh, outlined in red uh, hash marks, but uh, this area still, again, would retain its light industrial zoning, uh, would, if the overlay is put into place, be able to opt in to the CC1EC, which stands for Centers and Corridors Type 1 Employment Center. Uh, this is the zoning um, which most of the other uh, site is in for both Gonzaga Haven and for District 81. Just a few of the details, the whole total site is, is if we add all the parcels together, it's 10.8 acres. Um, there are 12 parcels that we're talking about. As I mentioned, their zoned light industrial would continue to be light industrial with the overlay, um, and it is in the Logan neighborhood. Again, kind of a quick summary of the outreach um, that we have, and here we are at the hearing. Again, the plan commission does recommend uh, approval of this item. And I did put uh, a little slide in here for public testimony in case there is any public testimony. There was one letter um, uh, from Bemis neighborhood early on. Um, they did receive a response from um, Jonathan Malahan of Catholic Charities and answered a lot of their very more site specific questions than this overlay really addresses. So in the site design. So I did also attend a Bemis um, Neighborhood Council meeting virtually, so I thank them for that invitation. And Logan has not been meeting, so I was not able to attend their meeting. All right. and that is my, my quick flyby on that, but I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Any questions for Terrell? I might just have a comment if I could. Yes. Um, so thank you so much for your help. And um, I'm a big supporter of this uh, with all the stuff going on in that area. Um, just one of the things that I wanted to comment on, I did get a few emails from community members that got the letter in the mail um, expressing that there were something was being changed around the zone area. And I know legally we have to explain to our community members what's happening uh, through our special zoning codes and CC1 and those type of things. Um, but they're very confused because um, in our realm, in, you know, being on the planning commission or um, working in city hall, we kind of hear these terms thrown around. And so I wondered if maybe um, we could maybe revisit how we send out those postcards, if there's an easier way to explain what's going on. Um, because people get worried when they see that and then they're not sure what to do. And so. Um, Obviously, a different conversation than what, what's going on here, but I just wanted to note that I did get a few people writing in saying, what is happening? Oh, my gosh. And, um, and so I, I just wanted to note that. And I think that there is an easy solution, which is just, um, you know, obviously going along with the law to say that we have to notify them, but maybe um, having some layman's term um, around what's happening just so that people don't freak out. So that was my only observation. Thanks, Councilmember Burke. Um, any other questions for Terrell? We had no uh, public comment signed up for tonight, so with no other questions, if anyone else has any commentary, I would invite that at this time. All right. Seeing, hearing none, I will just say, uh, briefly that uh, getting this Gonzaga Haven project lifted up is a, is a big thing and the city has cooperated and there's, we vacated things and we're doing a NEPA study right now. Hopefully that's gonna be done in the next few days. Terrell and her group got this done and this is actually an emergency ordinance so it takes five votes to pass. Uh, so a lot of people are trying to get this project uh, going and I appreciate that and it will make a very small dent in the problem, but every unit helps, and this is particularly forward thinking and um, really a wraparound uh, community involvement, including with the university and the schools, so I'm excited about it. 
With that, I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Council Member President? Yes, Council Member Wilkerson. You know, I support this, but I would just like to make sure that these types of expedited opportunities will be available in other neighborhoods yep. as we go through our housing process. I think there are lots of opportunities, and now that we've seen it can be done in a more timely fashion than what I have observed currently. Yep. Excellent point. Excellent point. Is Amen. Any other comments? Okay. All right. Roll call vote. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinney. Aye. Council President and I. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes seven to zero and immediately goes into effect. And I have no other business before us. Everyone have a great evening. And again, reminder for anyone, the uh, public forum at six o'clock on the same channel on the issue of fluoride on Thursday, this Thursday. We are adjourned. <laughs>